So, um, if we look more than 50 years ago, um, this, was, uh, this was the state of the art. Um, well, sorry, I've, this, is, this is Frank Yates taken rather later, actually. I, I, this, is, this is the picture that, that appears in Joan Fisher Box's um, biography of Fisher, and I think this was taken in 74. But the millionaire calculating machine that you see there uh, was very definitely state of the art um, at the time of Fisher. And I think there's a quote from Gossett about, about the millionaire that, um, unless you have a horrid lot of tots to do, I fancy that's rather expensive. Um, it is rather expensive because it cost Fisher, uh, well, it cost the Institute on behalf of Fisher over 200 pounds. And you may remember from yesterday, 200 pounds was the initial sum that Rothamsted had to bring Fisher in. So this is looking back to the golden age when statisticians had all the expensive toys. Um, that's not true now, unfortunately. We, we know that our you know, biochemical and uh, molecular biology colleagues are the ones that have the expensive toys, and somehow we still pay the, the same full economic cost to justify it, but um, nevertheless, the fun is elsewhere. However, um, as, as, as I shall say as we, as we go through, um, it is very important uh, that... Now, whatever kind of computer you have, you keep in touch with the data. And a comment from Fisher is very ap apt here. I've put it on the slide where he says that most of my statistics has been learnt on the machine. And you know, this is something that uh, we have to be careful not to lose in the computer age. Um, OK, the next uh, development, of course, was the, was the, um, the tabulator sorter, which was used for a lot of... Uh, Computing, but this is pre-computer, so I won't say anything about that. Alison may want to make a comment in the in the discussion, assuming I I leave time. Um, but the point needs to be made still that even in those days, with when people were using electronic, well, sorry, electric calculators, the analyses were still very sophisticated. I think it's tempting for us now with our laptop computers to be feel fairly patronising of uh, of the old style statisticians, but they did some staggeringly complicated analyses, even with um, you know, calculators and, and pencil and paper. So the kind of things, I, I went through the Rothamsted annual report to find some of these, uh, but the sort of things that were going on were two to the end designs with confounding between treatment interactions and blocks, the kind of thing that you'd challenge your students to do and they'd fail, I think, now even, um, no, unless they used a, a, a package, of course. Um, Quasi-factorials, all sorts of things like that, and, of course, probate lines and probate veins. Um, David Finney's book gives the detail on how to do that by hand, which was, uh, as I said yesterday, uh, the book that Gavin Ross gave me to read, first of all, when I, when I arrived at Rothamsted, because I was going to be responsible for the probate analysis part of, of Gavin's Maximum Likelihood program. Um, but I guess the thing we do have to recognise is that the data sets are relatively small, um, the models were fairly simple, and uh, despite Fisher's comment about learning you know, all your statistics on the machine, um, I think the amount of work that was being done must have you know, limited at least some people's time for innovation, possibly not Yates, but maybe the minions who were uh, ploughing away in the engine room had rather less time to think. And in fact, there's a quote from Frank Yates, again from a Rothamsted annual report, um, the analytical work has again involved a very considerable computing effort. That's 1952. However, um, help was on the horizon because... Oh, sorry, I, I did just reproduce one of the early analyses by hand um, out, of, out of the Rothamsted archive. Um, this is a Latin square being analysed by... Well, not by hand, but by calculator. 4 by 4 Latin square fertiliser treatments on potatoes. And those of you who looked at some of the um, package comparisons that Ivor Francis... Ivor, Ivor Francis, I believe I have to pronounce it... Um, did in the 1970s will know that many of the stats packages um, got the Latin square analysis wrong in those days with uh, incorrect degrees of freedom because it's an incomplete factorial in structure, although the, the blocking structure is clearly raised by columns. So you know, quite complicated things were being done, um, albeit at the expense of a lot of, a lot of work. But help was at hand, and this is the start of the computer age, um, and I think John Gower's right. I'm going to quote him in case anybody questions my assertion. But uh, John Gower, uh, in a paper in the Rothamsted Annual Report in 85, actually which followed his giving a similar talk to this at the 150th RSS anniversary, uh, makes the claim that this was the first computer to be associated primarily 
with agricultural research and with statistics. And this is back in the days when the statisticians owned the computer. Um, uh, things went from bad to, well, things went from that wonderful state to the state where the computing department owned the computer, and now we're back with the statisticians owning their own computers, which is, again, one of the interesting uh, uh, circuits that, that computing does. But I'll try and remember to say more about that as we go along. So here it is. You can see it's a, a, massive, uh, a massive structure and not especially powerful. Um, for example, you had only one user at a time. The user sat at a console and uh, did the work. Um, input was on paper tape and output was to an electric typewriter, which actually may have been more convenient than the subsequent line printer output because I can remember you know, times at Rothamsted for the, um, the book that they did of the Yields of Experiments, having these things retyped into the, uh, into the book. <laughs> So it came out on an electric typewriter. Um, programming was all in machine code, instructions on a rotating disk. And if you do the calculations uh, for how much space, no, data space they had, it's probably less than I've got on this watch. Um, so no, a very um, no, limited um, setup, but nevertheless um, you know, something that allowed statisticians to start thinking about programming and algorithms. Um, when it comes to optimal programming, Again, this is before my time, so I'm, I'm relying upon my colleagues, you know, like John Gower and Howard Simpson, the late Howard Simpson. Um, optimal programming, well, you had this, this disk that went round that could be read when it, you know, the parts of it reached the head. So your optimal programming was to try and get the program to work in such a way that you wanted to read something just at the moment when the head came round. Otherwise, you had to go an extra revolution and you lost time. And you know, clearly much misplaced ingenuity was spent in, in making this all work. But this was the you know, a time when we, they could start writing programs and some very sophisticated programs were written. You can see um, initially the idea was that you were replacing the kind of things that were going on um, you know, on pencil, well, pencil paper and calculating machine, just sort of replicating that. But it started to move towards more general programs, uh, particularly, say, with Yates' algorithm, which you'll know is a sort of... Uh, precursor of Wilkinson's algorithm for Anaba that uh, I used in Genstat, um, that was done on the 401, and then we had uh, the fit quan, pro quan program that fitted main effects and interactions in multi-way tables. So this is part of a, of a general um, trend here to try and develop um, general programs rather than specific little algorithms. Um, and again, you can see uh, the start of various types of model fitting going on here as well. Um, and including you know, multivariate analysis. So there's you know, some quite complicated things w w were being done. Um, in the 1960s, well, 61, it was a matter of getting more of the same. Rothamsted got a second computer like that, um, which allowed them to cope with the, the amount of work. But if you look, um, the last two years, last year when the two computers were present, they analysed you know, 14,000 data variates, which is quite a substantial number, um, probably with the decline of field experimentation at Rothamsted. I doubt we're doing that much from field experiments now. Um, but it took 4,000, this is from the annual report, 4,731 hours. If you do the calculations, that equates to 590 days. So you know, what you can say is that the machines were flat out, um, allowing for holidays you know, and you know, weekends, holidays and, and downtime. So... Um, something needed to be done. And what, what happened, of course, was that 63 was the um, move into something that looks more like a computer with the Ferranti Orion, which had a high-level language called Extended Mercury Autocode, uh, which I have to say I haven't seen any programs in this, but it had um, the attributes of a general-purpose computing language. And so you could, again, start to move towards general programs. Another big plus was that it could run more than one program at once, um, kind of thing we take for granted. And with you now our multi-core laptops, um, that's happening even without us thinking about it with just the one user. Um, and links with telex to other institutes, including Wellsbourne, where John Nelder was, uh, um, was, was, was working. And so the process continued of replacing these special purpose programs with general programs and algorithms. Um, but I guess you'd say the next big step forward at Rothamsted was when John moved from Wellsbourne to become head of statistics when Frank Yates retired and work started on Genstat at Rothamsted. So 
At that point, um, the department had the ability to program in Fortran. Uh, again, there's a nice link to Edinburgh here because initially the work was done on an IBM 360 at the Edinburgh Regional Computing Centre, uh, which I think involved cards going backwards and forwards to begin with. But later on, certainly we had a telex link, which uh, you'd sort of worry about how fast you could get the information in. Could you get it in before you ran out of money on the, on the, on the phone account? Um, now, of course, with the internet, these things, are, you, you just take them for granted. But you know, back in the 1970s, it was, a, it was a different world. But anyway, from 1970 onwards, I say they because I wasn't yet in the department, acquired an ICL 470, which uh, victims of the machine will remember was, was a bad copy of an IBM 360. So it took all the bad features of the 360 and added a few of our own just to uh, make it even less appropriate for... Um, numerical work. I, I won't talk about how the Fortran um, numerical um, algorithms work, but I can, t I can maybe talk about uh, you know, byte truncation later outside this. Um, so again, this was the start of things, and we had the early versions of GenStat being developed. And in those days, it was strictly for batch pro processing. Later on, it became interactive. Um, and I don't know, I was at a I was at the Biometric Susan conference um, last month, and there was a lady there from Zimbabwe. I think it's remarkable that she'd survived as an intellectual in Zimbabwe through the recent troubles. What was all, all the more remarkable was that she remembered GenStat 4. So this is the original GenStat, but um, in this case, we're running, I'm running the PC-DOS version that was implemented in about 1984, but it's still the original syntax. Um, with one or two interesting, interesting quirks, you can see this um, reference line um, because in those days it, you had to initialize the, you know, the program to say how much data space you wanted and how many of the different types of variables you wanted, you had to have this line reference in there. Um, then when I tried to ge generate a job for the um, NELDA um, conference at, at Imperial, I, I got out my copy of uh, uh, 403E and started typing away and nothing happened. Then I realized I should have said reference. Uh, still nothing happened because nothing would actually happen until you type run. So it was very much thinking about batch processing. And one of the things that we did have, that we still have, was the ability to, to stack several jobs in the, in, the one, in the one run. And this was you know, down to the days when you'd, take, you, you'd sit in a queue before you got a run. Um, and so if you could put the whole day's work into a single run, you know, the, the various biologists who got there are unimportant things to do would... Uh, you know, they'd have to wait for 12 statistics jobs before, before they got started. Um, the problem you then have was that you'd make a syntax mistake in the second line and uh, all of them would fail, but that was, uh, that's, that's by the by. Um, okay, so this is the GenStat, GenStat 4 syntax you can see. Uh, victims will remember it, and you can see we're, we're printing out things with a rather nasty default format. Um, um, this, is, this is a probit analysis from, from, from David Finney's book, so you can uh, confirm that I've got the right answer. Um, and so we run through doing a generalized linear model, calculating log dose, defining the terms in the, in, in the model, defining the, mo the model somewhere here. Oh, the error, here we are. Y, error equals binomial, link equals probit, so you can see what we're doing. We do a fit, add the common regression line, and finally we get out the, the analysis in a what can I say, rather unfriendly capital letters form. We had to use capital letters because the CDC computers, which had only 60, 60 bits, would have 6-bit um, six um, six, six bytes to represent characters, and they couldn't represent um, anything in lower case. So you, know, you, you were constrained by the, by the computers of the time. Um, and here we have the analysis of deviance table um, and you know, the analysis... Uh, Sorry, no, I've just added, what have I added? I've added, that's right, I've added parallel lines, try different lines, and then finally I've got the analysis of deviance table, which you still can't get out of certain uh, American packages, I should say. So this was the kind of thing that people were, people were developing in those days. Um, you know, when I look back at it, I'm staggered about as to how unfriendly it was, but nevertheless, it was a, a huge step forward uh, because they had a macro structure that allowed you to produce programs, and you could store those in, in files and bring them back. And we, we had contributions from, uh, from Scotland and from as far away as Australia that went into this. Um, OK, so what was happening? What were the RSS doing in those days? I think the, um, the most important event was a meeting on the 15th of December, 66, uh, instig well, organized um, 
by John Nelder and Brian Cooper at the Atlas Laboratory Chilton. And this was a very important, I think, very seminal meeting because um, as a result, this led to the Working Party on Statistical Computing that uh, then um, supervised the applied statistics algorithms and then later GLIM. Um, large meeting with, with lots of representatives, and you can see the sort of topics that were covered, um, not just Rothamsted, but also uh, work at the Atlas Computer Laboratory at the University of Lancaster, at the Met Office, and also talk from Brian Chambers that um, discussed what was going on in the USA, including you know, the early statistics packages over there, like uh, BMDP and SPSS and PSTAT. Um, one or two nice quotes from, 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 oh, sorry, themes, yes. Um, I wonder, I mean, this kind of shows how little things have changed because, uh, you know, you and Paige was talking about multiple regression and complaining about its misuse. Um, I suspect it's even more misused now because it's not just statisticians that have the opportunity to misuse it. It's going to be misused by all kinds of untrained people. Um, therein lies one of the challenges that, uh, that, I, that I'll mention. Um, but there was, I, this, this quote I, I really liked because uh, uh, they talked a lot about conversational use and, and those there said, oh, no, they thought this would be a bit tricky because they weren't sure that they could you know, think quickly enough to make conversational use worth, worthwhile. And you've, you know, you're thinking now of one person using a whole computer with a queue building up outside the office. And so we've got this comment from uh, Vickers. Clearly, if those of us around this table were presented with a console, most of us would spend too much time racking our brains and activity would be pretty slight. But let us not forget that the sixth form boy, and I think we put in parentheses girl there just to satisfy half the audience, um, who sees a console today and then goes on to take a degree in statistics and computation will be a very fine console operator in five years' time. Such people who can react to consoles quickly will be with us soon. I, mean, I like this because I was a sixth form boy just at that point, and I, I've been meaning to ask John Gow, you know, when he selected me for the job at Rothenstead, did he recognise a first-class console operator, or was there something else that he had in mind? However, um, okay, so working party on statistical computing, the algorithm section of applied statistics came from this, and you know, the initial aim was to provide the basic building blocks for a statistics programme, and I think John Gow still... Um, regrets that we have packages and would much rather have people writing programs. Um, but later on, I think it became a very good way of publishing quite complicated techniques because you know, it's one thing to see the equations in an RSSB paper. Then you've got the problem of working out how on earth you're going to do it. Um, if you get the algorithm, you, you, you're, you're straight there. So certainly you know, many people, myself included, have published algorithms in applied stats and... Uh, they've been recognised as being equally valid to you know, the mathematical papers that we've also tried to publish from time to time. Um, so I think it's, in some ways it's probably right that it, it came to an end in, in 97 because possibly all the things that could be you know, packed into a relatively small part of a journal uh, had been done, but uh, I still look back on it with a certain uh, nostalgia and I still dip into it as well for useful things. Um, okay, so little Rothamsted plug, over 9% came from Rothamsted associated authors, and I'm, I think the trawl goes rather wide. That includes people who were about to work there or had already left. Oh, gosh, okay. Um, right, well, Glim, um, here we have Glim, the history of Glim running through from 1972 to 1978, um, and I won't talk much about prison, but let me just show you Glim. Whoops, oh, okay, I would have shown you Glim. Let's see if we can get back to Glim. Um, so Glim was, I think, the first interactive program that, that, that many of us met, and as such, it was hugely influential. Um, and it was, this is getting back to the idea that um, you know, Fisher had, and that Nelda's always been very keen on, um, that you should be in touch with your data, and analysing your data interactively is clearly an important way of doing this. And this lies behind you know, John's promotion of hierarchical generalised linear models, with which I've been involved, because those you can run interactively in a way that uh, most Bayesian analyses won't. So there we are. That's the token comment about Bayesians to keep John Nelder happy in case anyone reports back. Um, <laughs> but this is, um, this is the same example being analysed in, in, in Glim 4. Um, I mean, I'm disappointed that I can't run Glim any longer on my computer because uh, um, Mr Gates did for it when he brought out XP. It runs in NT4, but it won't run in XP. So... Um, the next step was, was GenStat 5. That's really where I took over GenStat. And you can see the lessons from Glim were taken into GenStat to provide an interactive 
environment. You can see we, I'm typing, typing in and getting the analysis as we go along. Um, and that was the point at which we threw away the rather nasty GenStat4 syntax and produce something that was designed to last, including the ability to develop techniques and put them into a procedure which looks just like an ordinary command. Um, I have some comments on general algorithms which are, which are key to what we're doing um, and just mention three that have rough and associations. General balance, Nelda, and then myself and uh, uh, the algorithmic work was with Graham Wilkinson and, and also my paper with Randall Tobias. Generalized linear models, um, again, uh, a very general algorithm that then develops into things like GLMMs and HGLMMs. And the Edinburgh algorithm, of course, residual maximum likelihood, uh, Desmond Patterson and Robin Thompson. Um, so uh, I think the key thing when we're designing statistics packages, which is what we've done in, within GenStat, is to provide a research environment and I think Genstep pioneered this idea. Uh, it was certainly part of John Nelder's writings right back to the late 60s. Um, and the key thing is the ability to use commands as part of... Uh, now, any command can be used in a program, and the way you, you can do that is to allow you to save the output from commands in suitable data structures. This is non-controversial now, because uh, you're all using... If you're not using GenStat, you're probably using, using R. But it was controversial in those days, and certainly I know that R has borrowed a lot of the ideas uh, from GenStat because of the, you know, the cross-connection between John Chambers and, and the department. Um, so this is where we are now, and we have in some ways the best of both worlds because we still have the commands, but we now have menus built upon the commands to do the simple thing straightforwardly for the naive user. So, uh, okay, I think what we're looking for is an environment for the ordinary user that's pro protective and proactive. And I was going to have a little rant about expert systems, but I'm down to two minutes. But I think those have been a huge disappointment. Uh, so many claims were made about what could be done with expert systems, and you know, none of them have come to anything. Um, I think we also want to avoid the statistics all strategy. And I had an example at this conference, uh, biometric conference in Africa, where we had a package you won't know it, it's got seven letters, begins with E, but it, it was willing to fit 50 different distributions to a set of data and then decide which one automatically um, should be used using a Komogorov smirnov test. And a young lady in a statistics department in an African university thought this was excellent, and um, it took a bit of doing to uh, get over the idea that it wasn't. Um, so I've put some ideas that we have for developing good statistical practice. Um, I mean, you know in your teaching you want to develop users' intuitive expertise, and we try to do that in the way the menus are based. Um, but I think one of the other key things is, is, is the way in which we do support our users elsewhere. So I've got a number of um, sites that have no statistician that are essentially using us to plan their experiments and to advise them on the analysis. And this is something that we're glad to do because it uh, makes the job more interesting. So I've got my final slide now, um, I hope. Yeah, so some questions to the future. Um, I mean, again, I wanted to spend more time on this, but uh, I, I got myself sidelined into reminiscing. But, you know, there clearly is an issue over the fact that statistics is now being done by people who aren't necessarily trained in statistics. And I think, you know, we, developing GenStat, regard ourselves as being at the sharp end of this. And, you know, we have a lot of strategies, that we hope, um, guide people into doing the appropriate analysis. Uh, but, you know, when CSTAT came in, many of the RSS ra were rather uneasy about it because they thought it might make statistics a closed shop. Um, many of you might want to say, if only, um, however. Um, free or commercial? Well, again, um, that's an interesting question because, you know, we notice... Um, in, in our case, I think we're, we're fortunate because we're a small enough organisation to be able to do both. So, you know, we charge uh, people in the developed world, but we don't charge... Um, non-commercial sites in the developing world, they have GenStat free, and you can also have it free for your teaching, so please pick up a CD on the way out. I don't want to carry them home. But, I mean, there are issues there, and it's interesting to see, you know, the idea of, uh, of things being free is being challenged now by even Rupert Murdoch, who believes that people should pay to visit his website for news, which is um, you know, quite a I think for those of us trying to make a living out of software, even a small living, it's nice to see that there is a recognition um, somewhere that perhaps you know, people should pay for things occasionally. Occasionally is good enough for us. We're only a small organisation. Um, the other big question, and again, this could be part of a separate talk altogether, 
Um, where will statistics being, be being done in the future? We have hear a lot about cloud computing and uh, Microsoft and Amazon and I think uh, Google have the idea that you know, eventually you'll stick your data onto some server farm, goodness knows where, and when Gmail's not down, you'll be able to run your, run your jobs and you know, it'll, all, it'll all happen for you somewhere else. Um, and you know, is that the way that statistics is going to go? I mean, the other contrast is that uh, my wife got fed up with the fact that I would be you know, playing with GenStat, my daughter would be um, doing Facebook with her friends, and my son would be playing computer games, all of us in the lounge in the evening, and she hadn't got anything to play with. So we went and bought her a netbook from John Lewis at a cost of about £300. And I was staggered to find that that was as powerful as the desktops that my colleagues were using at VSN you know, only two years ago. And so we can run GenStat on a £300 machine that would even go through EasyJet's um, hand luggage restrictions. <laughs> so, you know, is it on the cloud or is it not? Do you want to pay rent for your space or would you rather have a machine you can stick in your pocket? Um, I think, you know, it, we have lots of freedom now. Um, okay, and the final... Okay, no, sorry, there's another little rhetorical one which I'll leave you to read. But I think, you know, the bottom line is um, the way that computing has changed, I think there's a real challenge for all of us to stay relevant um, in the next 25 years and it will require a level of proactivity perhaps that uh, uh, many statisticians don't feel comfortable with. And you know, this was, again, one of the messages from the Susan conference. Biometricians are beginning to vanish, and why is that happening? It's because people are not looking for, statistic, for statisticians sometimes in the analyses they're doing. And uh, we all need to make sure that we are part of those investigations so that in 200, you know, the 200th anniversary, um, there's an even bigger audience than this one. OK, so that's, that's all. <clears throat> <clears throat>
taking into account all the problems that we have with data, data structures, missing data, all those sorts of things. But for me, the real change that I've seen in 30 odd years working in a business environment is the fact that I think today the majority of people fiddling around with data, analyzing data as they would see it, sometimes they, they do it very well, sometimes they don't do it so well, and that's not, that's not to criticize them. They may not have been trained. They may not have had statistics training. They may not have had numerate training. And the other problem that we face, actually, is that Microsoft products dominate, particularly Excel. And I have seen analyses. I have seen things done in PowerPoint. I, honestly, it, it makes me weep. But that happens. That's the reality of life. As a personal preference, on my laptop, I would not have a Microsoft product. But in order to talk to my clients, they insist on it is the standard. It, there, is not a, there is no other. You must produce things in Microsoft uh, formats. Um, but as we all know, modern, other software is better suited to modern statistical graphics and techniques. Roger's already given us an amazingly good plug for GenStat. My personal favorite is R, but you know, there's lots of philosophical debates we could have there. Um, why this is a problem now, and why it was less of a problem when we owned the data, when we owned the machines on which the data sat, is that the data are opportunistic, largely. I've heard lots of talk about samples and sampling and properly constructed samples of maybe 1,000. These are not in the main that. They come from um, computer systems that are there to run the business. And we have to get the data off them somewhere at the back end. And I was particularly struck by a comment that Stephen Pennock made, actually, uh, yesterday about the ONS is trying to move its data collection its statistical input into data collection upstream. So at this administrative, as he called it, stage, there is a statistical input. In a commercial environment, pretty much forget it. Those systems are there to run the business. And we just have to take what data we can. Um, there are also large data sets. Now, if, I, if I'd done this talk 10 years ago, data sets of that size would have been pretty much unknown to lots of people. But now with uh, gene sequencing data, with astronomical data, there are a lot of large data sets around. They have always existed in a commercial environment. Um, and the best example of the biggest data set I found the other day, and this is um, from Usama Fayed at Yahoo, I cannot conceive what 25 terabytes of new data every day means. I mean, I really just can't, uh, just, and to me, that is unimaginable. And as he says, one of the major problems they have is actually physically doing something with that. Because if you take a couple of days off, or if you consider, for example, a typical PhD project is three years, maybe four these days. You can't take four years to analyze that lot because you, know, you miss a day and you've got so much of a backlog, you have a real problem. Um, the important point for us is, and the reason why we as trained statisticians need to be involved at all stages is because of the size of these things, uh, what you'll often find is, if I can make this work, the standard statistical techniques will not work. Uh, they will often not fit what I might call a, one of our regular distributions, our commonly used distributions. And any, significant, any statistical test that will be, I've said likely to be, I will now say any statistical test on a large data set will be significant. End of story. Because the statistical tests we use were not designed with huge data sets in mind, broadly speaking. What we've heard about Fisher, for example, in those days, you could actually physically look at a data set, every point in that data set, and examine it. And that's one of the crucial differences today. We can no longer do that. We have to look at this through computers. Because there is a computer on everybody's desk, and as Roger's al already illustrated, every year they become more powerful. The, the processing power in a small, what is it really a relatively cheap computer, far outstrips what was available on mainframes only a few years ago. So to illustrate that point, um, this is some work actually that David Hand and I uh, did a few years ago. Uh, but I'll, I'll show you it now because it's still as valid as now as it was then. The other thing is there's a real difficulty in, in getting my clients to agree to publication. But we've already published much information on this data set. Um, it's from a database of about a million and a quarter credit card transactions in the UK. That is it. It is that skewed. I haven't chosen that £12,000 transaction arbitrarily. That is the highest value in the data set. It's not atypical to find a data set where three quarters of the observations sit below the mean. In this case, it's about 80%. I have found some data sets with almost 90% of observations sitting below the mean. So how do we handle this? 
Given that, most people these days in a Microsoft Office environment know about the average. But the average applied to a data set like that, I suggest, is questionable. Um, there are some other issues as well. Uh, and actually, we, we, yeah, we as statisticians know about all of this sort of stuff. But some of our colleagues might not. Um, I'll mention a couple of these. The first one is the, the top one there, the spikes and account balances. Um, David and I were talking before the session started about uh, how the banks and the financial industry runs, its, uh, runs, it, runs today. If you have opened an account in the last few years, there is a very good chance that you, will have had, you won't be able to open account A without taking out account B. But what the banks very quickly realized was that when you open account B, you don't use it. So, ah, good wheeze from a marketing uh, person. We will enforce that a minimum balance must go in there. Then what they found was there were a lot of spikes at a pound. A lot of accounts with a pound in that never had any of the transaction. So then another marketeer said, well, this is all right. If we put, get the people to put five pounds in, no problem. So then what happened was there's a big spike of accounts with a fiver in that were never used, and so on and so forth. So you have those sort of patterns in there. And then the second one is uh, regularly find um, customers with more than one unique record number. Now, I don't know what your definition of unique is, but unique isn't multiple instances. Um, the, the other thing I would say, and this, this, this came up yesterday, actually, in the matter of the surveillance society, never, ever trust a clean data set. Data sets have errors. The bigger the data set, the harder it is to find them. Um, if somebody presents you with a clean data set, so for us, the message is live with it. They will be there. There will be errors. We have to find ways of coping with that. You cannot error correct everything. And partly because the last two points are really the important ones. If you try and instill or develop automatic error correction, you're likely to wipe out many of the interesting features. To demonstrate, these are two trade sectors which are a subset of that one and a quarter million transactions. Uh, the distribution on the left, those spikes are at exact multiples and um, of 10 pounds, 15 pounds, and 20 pounds, and also 6 pounds and 12 pounds. If you want more detail on this, have a look at the paper that David and I wrote, um, which is referenced a couple of slides ago. There are also spikes at 6 pounds and 12 pounds, which was at the time to do with incentives that petrol companies were, um, companies were running. The other distribution is one that you, you might be much more familiar with, as statisticians, nice skewed, nice sort of regular. But actually, if you look hard enough, there are some small peaks there. How do I know that? Well, actually, and those, those are what the two sectors are, petrol stations and supermarkets, chosen deliberately because they both have a lot of relatively frequent, relatively low-value transactions. But now if I look at local patterns, um, that spike you saw at £10 on the previous distribution is exactly. It's like, it's not, you know, it's not close, it's not vaguely distributed in any sort of normal Gaussian way. It is there, bang and nothing at 9.99, except, oh, there's a slight tail. And now, David and I had many discussions about this over the years. Next time you're at a petrol station, watch how people fill up their cars with petrol. Why do people, 9.99, 10, damn, damn, just missed it, 10 pounds and a penny, and people do this. The last time I was at a petrol station, the, the three pumps that I could see other than mine were um, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, and 50 pounds and 4p. Now, I find it difficult to believe that anybody's, the actual amount to fill up their tank was 50 pounds and 4p, but people will do this. If you look at supermarkets, actually, sort of rather different. There's now a spike at 9.99. Why is that? Mainly that's to do with pricing policies. The spike at 10, though, is probably not. And the reason I wanted to show these two is that actually there is some, I, I could spend all day going on about the, this particular data set which is, as I say, go look at the paper um, if you want to see more details. But the, the spike on the left is entirely um, consumer-driven. It's people's behavior driven. The one on the right is partly driven by people's behavior because some people will make one transaction. Hidden behind this, which I'm not going to show you, is the fact that some people will make six, seven, eight transactions in a supermarket every week, going in every day, sometimes making more than one transaction a day. So there's more levels of behavior like this. And the reason that that's important is that our models have to take account of these structures. We also need to identify which are the real features, 
which are process generated, and does that affect how we treat them within our modeling? So there's a computer on every desk. It's hugely powerful now. More and more people are doing their own analysis. Where does that leave us, really? Where does that leave us? Um, well, the first thing is, in a business, and now that Genstat's privatized, I'm sure profit is an imperative as well. Profit is the imperative, not publication. That's the thing that drives the business. Uh, the, other th the second point on there, you might want to take note of, generally speaking, businesses are not interested in developing new methods, which is one of the reasons I come to a conference like this, because actually this is where I learn about some of the new developments, new methods, things that are published. Businesses do not want to publish generally. They don't want to develop new methods unless they work. But of course, unless you've tried a method, how do you know that it works? So sometimes with this real, people, certain people in businesses, the statisticians would like to try new methods, but often they're not allowed to because businesses don't know that that method will work or not before we try it. We'd like to know first, please, if we can, which is obviously a contradiction. Um, so some of the issues that follow from that are that, um, and this has always been the case, but models are built on historic data and they're applied to future data. And the, probably the most stark example of, of what the, the pro, some of the problems that can cause uh, are everybody will be aware of the credit crunch. You might not be aware of some of, all, of the detail of it or all of the detail of it. But essentially, there was a massive, massive disconnect in this country that really started just about two years ago when Northern Rock first went bust. A lot of the models that were applied and being developed through those years are almost entirely invalid post that change. But what else do we have? So in the future, can we, develop, can we as statisticians help businesses to avoid this sort of situation by having models that uh, evolve in, in real time? A couple of talks have talked about the, the fusion of disparate data sources. Um, Roger's just said he's very skeptical about expert systems. I am too. I have to, I have to be honest about that. But is there a way we can help? We can Because so, there aren't many of us. That's the problem. There are 7,000 odd members of the, the, the RSS. Um, there are 18,000, as we heard yesterday, members of the... Um, American Statistical Association, there are tens of thousands of people working in businesses, all with a computer on the desk, all doing analyses. So how can we best help them? So is expert systems, um, is, is that a real, is that an option? Or is it just too difficult to do? Um, and finally, I put on here, it's statisticians' relationship with their clients. So Michael Rawlins this morning, I thought, had a beautiful, beautiful quote. Statisticians can be scathing. And that's absolutely true. I can be at times. I try not to be, but I can be. We must no longer, in a business environment, we must not allow ourselves to be scathing because people will just ignore us. It's not like being in an academic institution. It's not like being um, in, 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 an office, in, a, in, say, the Office of National Statistics or one of the, a public service body. If we are just rude to people and say, that doesn't work, they will just ignore us and they will do their own thing. And there lies, for me, the real, real danger. We have to find ways of engaging with people who are not necessarily statisticians, might not even have a great deal of uh, numerate training. However, despite all of that, and this is where we're going to have to work quite hard and be quite smart, is that we owe thanks to John Tukey. And I don't make any apology for going back to 1977. In fact, this was really John Tukey went back before this. Exploratory data analysis is critical. Whatever we do, look at the data. The problem is people will often choose the cheap and cheerful or the easy way of looking at that. We have to help people to look at their data better, to carry out exploratory data analysis as we would understand it as statisticians. And as part of that, um, Cleveland's first point there, um, or Cle the point that Cleveland made, is absolutely right. The problem is, going back to the, the point I made at the start, most people in many businesses today use Excel and PowerPoint, not the ideal tools for uh, any sort of data analysis, never mind exploratory data analysis. And um, I put this comment in, actually, and funnily enough, I was talking to somebody who's a data miner at BT uh, just the other day. My take on this informally, without going into the whys and wherefores of the differences between data mining and statistical computing, really, it's exploratory data analysis applied to large data sets. Um, However, we cannot shirk this challenge. Data-driven insight is crucial. We've already seen when one example, one trivial example, and we've gone for hours about that, about the credit crunch and why 
how the data were misused, models were misused, maybe not, and all that sort of thing. But actually, we need every decision in a business should be driven by data. There is no excuse for it not being because there is too much data. The trick is, how can we spread ourselves thinly enough, or how can we evangelize so that people will do it themselves and know how best to do that data analysis? Um, what, a couple of points, the, the final two points on there. Businesses generally want something that works now. I've already mentioned the typical three or four year PhD student. Frankly, that's laughable. That's stupid. From a business environment, if you say, we'll take four years to deliver you a thesis, well, is it any wonder that academics sometimes struggle to talk to businesses? Because we want something general, three weeks is a long time scale, never mind three years. I'm sorry, I'm being slightly provocative, but it's, this is the sort of issue I face, because I'd love to get more people more research projects, more good PhD students, statisticians in business. Well, I struggle. But we, we as, an in, we as a, a profession need to think about how we're going to do that. Um, a recent quote from John Chambers. Agree entirely. Get your data, do the analysis, and communicate it. In a business environment, I think communication is key. It's the most important point. We must also, and Helen Joyce uh, made reference to some of the, the developments that we must use, the internet, uh, dynamic interactive graphics, and she also mentioned Hans Roslin's site. If you haven't seen it, go and have a look. Hans Roslin, some of his interactive dynamic data analysis is really quite special to see. And we must do that. No longer is it enough for us to um, simply produce conditional plots or scatter plots or all the raft of incredibly powerful things we can, we can use if we don't use the power of technology to communicate those to our clients. Hence, communication is the most important um, part of, of, of the process, really. The final point there, the reason it's so important is with the democratization, horrible word, a bit like privatization, horrible word, but it, it sums up nicely what's going on. Again, going back to what Roger said, everybody in a business environment now has a powerful PC on their desktop. The latest version of Excel will process, in one step, a data file of a million rows and 16,000 columns. That is just too much to be allowed to somebody without any training in data analysis, frankly. Um, so this is my, my campaign. I'm going to try and get Excel 2007 removed from every desktop. Uh, if you know how I can do that, you know, please see me afterwards and, and talk to me about it. But who will provide the insight? Um, we've already heard, actually, from Stephen Stigler that there was an engineer prompted Francis Galton to, uh, to look at some other questions. In a business environment, I actually might be looking more for engineers and medics and statisticians. Partly because statisticians are likely to be scathing and say, no, you can't do that. Whereas given their, their, their training, both of which, both professions have some sort of numerical training, what they're trying to do is produce a usable solution. Might not be perfect, but given the nature of the data, given that we need to produce something quickly, given the need to actually reckon, remember that in a year's time, things will be different. So a lot of small things Practical solutions now are actually more important for a business, and engineers and medics are often better than statisticians um, for achieving that. So some final thoughts. Um, I'll quickly go through these, but... Yeah. With the presence for computer and data on most desktops, we actually um, risk losing involvement with much data analysis. Uh, and I see the, the, the president of the RSS uh, has arrived, so this is really a message for the RSS, David. I know it's not you personally, but you know, if you could organize it for me. Um, how do we as a profession develop the outreach so we're not the people who are scathing? We're at the heart of everything that businesses do and people come to us first. Uh, it's not a new issue. Friedman said that in 1997, Bryman a little later. Uh, my paraphrase is I put non-experts. He actually said engineers and computer scientists. So the engineers bit fits well with, with, with what I did. And then um, David said, uh, in his presidential address, or he described some of the issues of communication that we have. We cannot allow that. We cannot allow people just to exclude us from any sort of help, any sort of um, business contact, because what Freeman and Bryman were talking about was actually we must work with other disciplines. And in my case, we must work with people who may have marketing qualifications, MBAs. They're the worst, actually, because they sort of think they know everything. Uh, but we must work with these people, not be patronizing to them, we must work with them. So at that point, uh, I shall stop uh, just to note um, some references there. If you, can, if you deal with people in a business environment, the books, the top four books on the right-hand side 
Everybody should read those in a business environment, particularly creating more effective graphs. You as statisticians will look at this book and think it's trivial because it's about the, the effective display of data in a business environment. And the reason that one is so crucial for everyone, I think, in a business environment to use is because it takes the concept of Tuft, of Cleveland, of all the people who've worked on statistical graphics over the years, and actually puts it into an Excel type of framework and shows people how they can do better in the commonly available tools. So on that note, thank you for listening. I hope that's been useful.